My guest this week is Peter McPhee, and this week we are going to discuss the French Revolution. And you're Australian yourself, so how did an Australian study, begin to study the French Revolution? I was very attracted when I was a student at university because it was such a, a significant event in world history. And it was at a time when uh, there was a lot of interest in writing the history of uh, popular movements of the crowd. Uh, a very famous book just had appeared uh, by George Ruday called The Crowd and the French Revolution. And I was very interested in how we could go about uh, capturing the the actions and particularly the ideas of people who for most historians had been silent. And so I was very attracted to that. And I did a I did a PhD thesis on 19th century France on on the on the countryside. Uh, and then I moved back and studied the French Revolution. So I was very attracted to this extraordinarily significant movement in, in world history, which really has repercussions all around the world. Hmm. And I feel like we should begin at uh, the two people that we mentioned before in our Napoleon series as well, and you may be familiar with them. That is one of them is Talleyrand, and the other is Lafayette, who will be played be a significant part in the American Revolution, but also a big part of the French Revolution as well. So let's start there and begin with Talleyrand's royal, and begin with and Lafayette and what the part they would play in the revolution. Oh, I think they're extraordinarily uh, significant characters for uh, for an, a number of reasons. I mean, one of the decisive turning points in the French Revolution has to do with the reforms that are made to the Catholic Church. And uh, Talleyrand obviously plays a very significant role uh, in in accepting uh, those reforms. Uh, he was a know, bishop there originally, wasn't he? That's right. And... Uh, he, um, it's very significant that someone who has um, a, an important ecclesiastical post uh, pl plays such an important role in accepting those church reforms because, because very few bishops are prepared to accept them. About half the parish clergy are, but very few of the bishops. Um, of course, some people are very cynical about whether Talleyrand uh, actually has any real religious commitment at all, or whether he's simply a, a, a political figure. Um, but he and Lafayette, are, you know, two of the very, very significant uh, players in the, particularly in the early years of the revolution. Um, Lafayette, of course, has an extraordinary uh, standing in, in France because of his role in the American War of Independence. Uh, and he's one of the really significant players in the early years of the revolution. And someone who uh, Jacobins such as Robespierre are very suspicious of because they worry that one of the consequences of the upheavals of the French Revolution will be that a military leader might be tempted to seize power with the army. And uh, Lafayette and, and Robespierre really are, are, are bitterly opposed during the critical years of 1792 and 1793 when Lafayette actually flees So let's begin with understanding the state of France as well in the 1780s, and we're going to discuss some key events a little later on. So then let's begin with understanding the state of France, or the state of the citizen of France find himself in under the reign, later reign of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Well, certainly um, the regime of Louis XVI is facing a really significant crisis in the 1780s. And I think that that crisis has two broad characteristics. One is a very pragmatic financial crisis because the uh, the monarchy has been involved in supporting the, the uh, American colonists in their war of independence uh, against Britain. And that's successful, but comes at an enormous cost to the French treasury so that Louis XVI and his regime have a huge fiscal uh, problem. Uh, France is effect effectively bankrupt. But there's also a crisis, if you like, of legitimacy that uh, the, the closing decades of the 18th century, of course, are the years of an extraordinary intellectual movement across Western Europe, uh, particularly strong in France that we today call the Enlightenment. Um, 
which is a, a, a set of presuppositions about the, the nature of knowledge, the origins of knowledge that are, are profoundly at odds with the underpinnings of uh, the old regime monarchy. Um, there's a real crisis of, of legitimacy about the authority of a regime which is based on a noble privilege, which is based on the privileges of the Catholic Church, which is based on absolute monarchy and so on. Uh, that more and more educated people in particular are critical of the lack of change inside that system. So certainly by the 1780s, the regime is confronted with a, a crisis, but there's no sense that people have that it's necessarily a revolutionary crisis. No one's talking about uh, the desire for a revolution. I mean, that's very much something which is produced by the events of the last couple of years of 1787, 88, 89, and the way in which Louis the Sixteenth and his ministry really mismanage their response to that crisis. So the French Revolution um, is not inevitable. Yeah. Uh, it's the result of uh, the way that Louis the Sixteenth and his regime uh, mishandle their response to those crises. And then in 1789, during that uh, this mismanagement, there are a series of revolutionary actions. Uh, that occur in in Paris, such as the 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 tennis court oath, the storming of the Bastille, uh, and then the the great fear in the countryside. Hmm. And let's give a little bit background on Louis XVI's reign, because it's in recent research, and we talked a little bit about this before the recording that as well. That's come up that Louis XVI might have actually been autistic because it's behavior. It's someone sent in his behavior without revealing who he was. And they came back and they said that it's his behavior fits the what that of an autistic person. So let's discuss this and then talk a little bit about this reign because when thinking about it and reading about his Lewis behavior, it kind of makes sense that he, and I mean, you will explain this, I hope, but when you, you talk about it, it kind of makes sense of how he was as a person, and it explains quite a lot about his reign, really, to me. Well, there are, there are two points that I'd, I'd want to make about that argument that Louis XVI is autistic. I mean, one is that we have to be, of course, extremely careful uh, before we look back over uh, more than 200 years and, and start diagnosing someone's mm. uh, physical and mental con conditions. Um, and there may there certainly are aspects of Louis XVI's behaviour um, that we might we might think fits um, the idea of someone being uh, mildly autistic, but then there are other aspects of his behaviour that don't seem to fit. I mean, Louis XVI, for example, uh, kills a huge number of animals, mm. uh, about six thousand animals every year. It's his greatest passion. And I'm not mm. sure that killing animals is a symptom of autism. Um, he's also someone who uh, is quite gifted at language. He spends the last weeks before his execution in translating books from English into French about the execution of Charles I of England. So we have to be very careful before we start uh, putting labels on people. But the second point that I'd make is even if we were to decide he had autistic uh, characteristics, uh, so what? Um, I mean, huge numbers of people are uh, somewhere on the, the spectrum of autism. Many uh, rulers in the past, many significant leaders have had significant uh, uh, illnesses or, uh, or mental problems, but we don't... We don't, uh, for example, dismiss Winston Churchill because he was an alcoholic. Mm. Um, and many of the most brilliant people in history, uh, I think, have been uh, have been mildly autistic. Um, it's often the basis of people being brilliant at, at particular things that they do. So uh, even if we even if um, a team of doctors was to conclude, yes, evidence suggests that. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth was autistic. My response would be to say, "So what? Oh. What does what does that prove?" I mean, I think there are good 
there are good reasons for for arguing that someone like Robespierre, for example, about whom I've written a biography, there are good reasons for arguing that he had some autistic characteristics, but <laughs> he was also a very brilliant uh, politician, a very passionate man about yeah. the revolution. And I don't think that, you know, giving a label to people is necessarily very helpful. Um, I think we have to judge people on on their on what they do and say, uh, rather yeah. than simply saying, "Well, as that historian has said, well, Louis the Sixteenth was put to death because he was autistic." I mean, mm, it's just right. nonsense. Yeah, nonsense. Yeah. So let's turn to the Jews. I thought about as well. Marie Antoinette came from to be the bride of Louis the Sixteenth and would surpass many of her sisters in the as uh, and become the one of the prominent. Maybe not, maybe not prominent is the right word, but she would be, but might not be, not, I don't know the other right word in my head right now, but let's talk a little bit about Marie Antoinette coming to France and becoming the Dauphine, sorry, Dauphine, I think it's not right. I don't, I don't know if I mentioned a little bit my France, it's not very good. French, not very good, but let's talk a little bit about Marie Antoinette as well, because she is also an important part of the French Revolution and the course of the French Revolution as well. Oh, yes. And, um, I mean, it, it, she is an extraordinary character. I mean, we need to, mm -hmm. we always need to remember that these two, these two children are forced to, to marry when they're in their early teens. Uh, you know, they're 14 and 15 years old uh, and they're flung together. And it's a, an extraordinarily difficult situation for them um i think what historians now realize more and more is that any suggestion that marie antoinette is this um sort of frivolous flippant uh giddy woman about the court is um very limited and that historians increasingly uh see her as someone who is politically a very significant figure even though that she's not directly involved in directly in, in decisions of, of state in the ministry, but behind the scenes, she's a very significant uh, figure and certainly someone who I think plays a crucial role in constantly pushing Louis XVI towards an intransigent position. The great tragedy for, for Louis XVI is that he is a man who is not particularly interested in politics and not particularly good at politics. Mm. And he's in a situation where he's constantly caught between his desire to uh, do things that will benefit his people. He's co seriously committed to the well-being of his people. But at the same time, he's got very influential people around him, uh, such as Marie Antoinette in particular, who are advising him to be intransigent in his opposition to the revolution. And uh, Louis XVI from... 1788 onwards is constantly vacillating between those two extremes. Hmm. Uh, it's my understanding that her mother, the famous Maria Theresia, as well, and I do think that Joseph II as well, to some extent, was, you know, a, they not wanted to meddle in politics, but she was made, made there to be seen and not heard, made, so to speak. Because and certainly there's, um, you know, the assumption that many people make about Marie Antoinette when she arrives is that uh, her role her role is to um, be Louis XVI's uh, wife and to have children. And she obviously, mm -hmm. they have some difficulty in, in, in having children initially. But she's also someone who is, uh, you know, like Louis XVI, is uh, an intelligent person. Uh, who lives in a who lives in a in a bubble? Who lives in an extraordinary sort of hothouse environment, where she's divorced from understanding the the real issues that confront most people. She lives. It's another worldly existence at Versailles. Within that context, she's someone who certainly is a is politically active and, and significant. How does let's talk about some of her political. Sorry, political actions because they doesn't always seem to go well. Uh, she doesn't always come out greatly in history by at least older historians. So let's talk about some of the political actions that she did. And because, like I said, she 
I feel like she is somehow misunderstood that she, and especially by the older historians, like I said, because you know, she, her political, uh, they won't, they never, maybe they never, maybe they not necessarily come up positively for from her side. And she's, you know, she has a advantage of um, being someone who is increasingly the target of uh, of abuse and suspicion even before the revolution. Um, you referred earlier to the diamond ne necklace affair, mm. which is which is not her direct responsibility. We'll, 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 get, we'll, we'll get back to that in a second, I'm sure. Yes, and the, you know it's very significant. This is a, a, a major scandal. Uh, that involves really the theft of a very expensive diamond necklace and someone who um, who uh, who plays the role of Marie Antoinette in order to get access to this very expensive necklace. It's an act of theft. And even though Marie Antoinette is not involved in this matter at all... She uh, hated the necklace, she... I think, if I remember correctly. She did not, she did not find it pretty at all. She wanted the author of the necklace to disassemble no, no, right. it. But she, her reputation is tarnished by association. The fact, that, yeah. um, the, the fact that the woman who effectively is involved in stealing the necklace uh, passes herself off as working for Marie Antoinette uh, inevitably leads to some, a very bad press uh, for Marie Antoinette, uh, which plays into the increasing hostility that people have in the 1780s towards her because they uh, they see her as responsible for not having given uh, France a male heir to the throne early enough. Mm. And, of course, once the revolution breaks out and Austria is very hostile to the French Revolution, she's blamed as the evil power behind the throne who's responsible for turning good King Louis against the revolution. Uh, and in the process, she ends up the target of what today we would see as uh, very crude misogynist abuse, uh, very hostile abuse about her sexuality, uh, about her um, malevolent uh, power behind the throne. You know, she really becomes the, the scapegoat and the target for a lot of um, really negative misogynist abuse. Hmm. That's... Uh... Let's talk about some of the beginning of the rise of the, of the revolution itself, because that is, was it an organized revolution in a sense, or was there, um, but before that I want to ask, ask, was Marie Antoinette ever popular among the people, or was she disliked, especially especially after the Diamond Necklace affair, as you know, it would oh, be the gossip of the day, but was, how yeah. was her popularity in France? Certainly at the time of their marriage in um, in 1774, when they you know come to the throne as king and queen, uh, really, I think for, for much of the next decade, she is quite popular. Um, uh, and yeah, there's you know plenty of evidence of, of, of her popularity in the early years. But as I say, as the years go past and she doesn't produce a male heir, uh, there is increasing um, sort of sniping at her, snide remarks about her sexuality. What's wrong with the king? Uh, he's accused of being of having been emasculated by the queen. But certainly in the in the early years of her uh, of her being queen, she is uh, reasonably popular. Hmm. Let's so let's talk about this stare up to the revolution itself. We mentioned some. And another thing I want to mention as well, because that led to the revolution, is the bankruptcy. And Marie Antoinette, she did like having expensive balls as well. And that's one of the reasons, I think, that the statement bankrupt as well. Because and there is some historians that claims that had Louis XVI she refused to do it, it would it is to, it declared bankruptcy that would save the state of France and Louis and... Marie Antoinette, but they refused to do so, unlike what the Hanoverian kings did after seven years war, and that when they were broke, that they declared bankruptcy. But if let's if it had declared bankruptcy, and if they had said, let's say, they said that they oh we are bankrupt, we broke, what would that have made a difference at all, or would that would that have said the monarchy or some no, because they to the claim Louis the Sixth, the the regime is um is heavily in debt to international bankers 
uh, and the, the the problem is that there is a what we would call um, a sovereign debt crisis in in France, which is to say that um, such is the level of state indebtedness uh, that the the revenues that are coming in through taxes are really only being used to pay the interest on loans that have already been taken out. There is a fundamental gap between uh, income and expenditure for the Royal Treasury, and that's made far worse by France's involvement in the American War of Independence. So the gap between revenues for the kingdom and what and expenditure becomes greater and greater, and simply declaring bankruptcy wouldn't... Um, wouldn't have helped. I mean, France is the most powerful country in Europe, and it just would have uh, been disastrous if the most powerful country in Europe had simply said, well, we're bankrupt, we're not paying our debts. Mm. Uh, the great problem, uh, the great problem for Louis the Sixteenth, is that um, uh, the beneficiaries of the system, the nobility and the upper clergy, uh, refuse to renounce their, uh, their taxation privileges and that puts him in an impossible situation. I mean, in, in the end, the, the the French Revolution is caused by the refusal of the privileged orders to, to contemplate radical change. Uh, it's a crisis uh, within the elite of French society, as well as a broader uh, crisis as well. Now, let's compare this to England, who did, like I mentioned, did declare bankruptcy, and it's hard to imagine, but back then I do believe they weren't very popular a lot to be allied with, and that's the job away with it, because they weren't the British Empire we know today yet, and they could, so they, and they, nobody did really like what would be inside, on the side of England at the time, so they could get away with declaring bankruptcy, unlike France, which was this one of the biggest and most powerful countries in Europe at the time. Yeah. But by this stage, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a a national bank of England and mm. the finances of the British Empire are, are, are much more stable than uh, the situation in France where they're still dependent for any government loans on the international money market and interest rates are, are, are rising quite quickly. So... It's not until Napoleon that there is effectively a Bank of France which can help to stabilise the, the French monetary system. Let's, talk, let, let's go back to the stirring up to the revolution. Was this an organised revolution or was it mostly people beginning to talk and, and organise that we are going to storm the house, we're going to have a revolution and take down the monarchy? How did the popularity and talk of revolution because that come along? And who was it the elite mostly or was it the lower classes that wanted a revolution? Oh, well, the, the great contrast between the French Revolution uh, and, for example, the Chinese and Russian revolutions is that there is no revolutionary party. You know, there is no uh, re revolutionary group which is calling for revolution or organising for revolution. There's no Bolshevik movement, for example. So that it, this the... different, Yeah, this wasn't a political, political revolution, as far as I understand. Well, you know, when the when the third estate deputies arrive at uh, Versailles in May 1789, they believe that they're they certainly uh, believe that they're going to be involved in making some significant reforms, but no one's talking about the idea uh, talking about the idea of revolution. There's no revolutionary party, uh, and it's not until later in the year, uh, in October, September, October, when they look back and start talking about the magnitude of what they've done, that they start talking about it being a revolution uh, that's been achieved. So um, th this is a this is a revolution that uh, is generated more or less spontaneously because of the failures of Louis the Sixteenth and his court to manage the situation. So um, the first act of revolution, which really is the the tennis court oath, uh, in in uh, in 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 June 1789, is uh, an action that's taken by middle class deputies to refuse to leave until they've given France a constitution to call themselves the National Assembly. That's a revolutionary act, but it's not one that they'd been organising for weeks and months in in advance. 
uh, nor is the storming of the Bastille. That's something that's generated from within the popular working classes of, of Paris itself. So uh, the, the the revolutionary movement in France is, is much more spontaneous uh, in its response to particular crises uh, than what you would find in the Russian or Chinese revolutions. Now, Metternich, the Austrian ambassador and politician, would say that, right in his memoirs, I think, or he would say that the the French Revolution was not a political revolution, but a social one. Do you agree with his view that this was a social revolution rather than a political? Oh, I, I personally think it's both, but I, I think Metternich is absolutely correct to say that it was a social revolution uh, because the really, you know, the most radical uh, changes that the French Revolution brings are the abolition of feudalism and the abolition of a social order which is based on institutional privilege uh, for the nobility and for the Catholic Church. Metternich himself, remember, came from a, a, a uh, an Austrian noble family, uh, and he knew very well why the French Revolution was such a threat, because it was the French Revolution was an attack on the power of people like Metternich. Uh, and on everything that they that they believed in as the basis of society. The, the single most important social change of the revolution is the abolition of feudalism, which is bound up with the abolition of noble privilege, uh, the privileges of the Catholic Church and uh, and so on. So it's, it's a profound social revolution. Uh, but I think it's also a political revolution because it's the basis of a political system which is going to be, uh, which is fundamentally going to be based on the idea of popular sovereignty of some form of constitutional elected government. So it's a political revolution as well. Let's talk about the beginning of the revolution and the storming of the Bastille, which is arguably one of the most famous parts of the revolution, I think. So let's begin to talk about the storming of the Bastille and how it occurred. Well, it's it's very much a um, a response of working people in Paris to the fears that they have that the um, the court uh, and the and the army, the royal army, are going to simply close down the Estates General out at uh, out of Versailles, which by that stage is the National Assembly, and the rumours are rife in in Paris because the. There are plenty of army movements in Paris among the, from the Royal Army, and the rumours are rife that the the court, advisors of Louis the Sixteenth, the leaders of the army, the nobility, are planning simply close down the National Assembly, and to therefore to to cancel all the, all of the hopes of significant change. But the storming of the Bastille is very much a defensive response to a perceived threat of a, a sort of military coup d'etat, if you like, against the National Assembly. Mm. But in the process, of course, it becomes a major act of revolution because it forces uh, Louis the Sixteenth really to uh, to recognise the powers of the National Assembly. Mm. Let's talk about the, the flight of uh, Louis Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette as the storm their their palace and as they try to escape but they, of course they are caught eventually but let's talk about it because it's quite an intense little episode that they, when they try to escape the children um, and yeah. they're caught in the revolution they reach Versailles as well and of course it's one of the fatal turning points of the revolution because uh, Louis the 16th on the first anniversary of the storming of the Bastille in July 1790, had taken an oath in front of the people of Paris mm. uh, to respect uh, the constitution, uh, to be a constitutional monarch. And here he was uh, a year later, fleeing the revolution and leaving behind a statement repudiating everything the revolution had stood for. So the flight to Varennes, or his capture at Varennes, is a major turning point in the revolution because it really uh, undercuts people's faith in the monarchy. Louis the Sixteenth, from then on, is seen as untrustworthy, as a perjurer. 
And even though he's you do, you do have the episode, uh, I, if I may, the humiliating humili- humili- episode where Louis XVI is in front of the crown and he a revolutionary beret on, on the top of his hat. And that's one yeah. of the most humiliating, I think, m- m- yeah. moments for Louis XVI's life. Oh, that's right. That's yes, in, in June 1792. Uh, and really, as historians such as Timothy Taggart have argued, it's really the flight of uh, the the attempt to flee the revolution in June 1791, which has an, an electric effect on people. Um, uh, it's really like as big an impact as the, the storming of the Bastille, because as the news reaches the countryside, you know people are, get a terrible shock that Louis the Sixteenth, who they've wanted to believe, is on the side of the people, who wants to be a constitutional monarch, who accepts the revolution. Uh, all of a sudden, they're learning that this is a man who's a perjurer. Uh, who wants to flee to the enemy. So it's a really significant um, uh, moment. I want to bring back Lafayette and another one, his actual person who helped them escape as well, because Lafayette is, I do believe he's one of those assigned to guard Louis and Marie Antoinette as well. And actual von Fersen, of course, is the lover of Marie Antoinette, is helping them escape as well. That's right. And he's, you know, Lafayette is really compromised by this because he's someone who very much wants to uh, keep the the monarchy in place, wants to strengthen the monarchy, who's really terrified of France becoming a republic. Um, So Lafayette himself seems to be rather compromised by, uh, by this. And when when uh, Lafayette is effectively the head of the French Revolutionary Armies in 1792, 1793, there's a great deal of suspicion about the extent to which he can be trusted. And of course, eventually he does emigrate, he does flee. Hmm. And another one that fled, I do believe, he is in England at this point. I do think he's trying to help the revolutionary movement, is Talera, though most people dislike him as he's not very. It doesn't come out as a really likable thing, you know. There are some that like him, I understand, but he's most he's not very well liked in England as well. But he is in England, I do believe, trying to help the revolutionary cause there. Yes, and he, he he is certainly mistrusted. I mean, he's a very very brilliant man, uh, but he's someone who um, people conclude quite quickly that. Uh, he is very manipulative. Yeah. Uh, he would always say that he was acting in the best, best interests of France as a whole, but he's someone who seems to be prepared to shift his allegiances depending on what suits him at the time. Uh, who as we to be... see with Napoleon, of course, later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's, you know, he's a, like Lafayette, he's a you know, profoundly significant figure for a very long period of French history, right up, right up to the 1830s. Now, I want to bring, bring some, when Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI is taken captive, there is, of course, resentment among the rest of the monarchs, monarchies in Europe, and naturally Austria as well is opposed to this. Uh, and here's her sisters, Marie Carolina, or Maria Carolina as well, is, of course, opposed to this revolution. But, there is a plan for Austria to attack and invade and set free Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI and bring back the monarchy, but it does seem to come to nothing. But let's say it has, has happened in Austria and would have attacked France. And the, is there any chance that under the revolution, that is, the country was in such disarray that they could have succeeded? Because it doesn't seem to happen anything with the plan that they go to attack and free France of, from, from the revolution. Oh, no, once. Once uh, the monarchy is overthrown in August 1792, um, uh, there's no realistic possibility of uh, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette being liberated by the Austrian army. And Louis XVI, of course, is put on trial within a few months. This all happens very quickly. Um, But there's really... uh, There's really no possibility that Louis the 16th or later on Marie Antoinette again somehow to be rescued uh by mm. the Austrian monarchy 
even if Austria had succeeded with the rest of Europe in overthrowing the French Revolution in 1793, and and you know they, it's certainly a, a real threat. Um, Marie Antoinette would have been put to death long before they reached Paris. Let's talk about the trial because at the time did not exist at the time. I would say it was more or less a kind of root court when people have made up their minds, so it wasn't really a fair trial. Let's, so let's talk a little bit about the trial of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. I want to begin with Louis XVI because there are some. The trial of Marie Antoinette as well is rather tragic, I think, and I, I want to discuss that one a little after the trial of Louis himself. Oh, well, I think that um, it's obviously a, a, a political trial and historians are divided about just how damning the evidence is against Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, uh, to what extent they had uh, had been involved in um, actually passing on secrets to the, uh, to the enemy. There is absolutely no doubt that Marie Antoinette was fundamentally opposed to the French Revolution and was doing whatever she could to oppose it. Uh, but she and Louis the Sixteenth um, really go to uh, go to their deaths because they've made it absolutely plain that they're uh, they're intransigently opposed to the French Revolution and would welcome the victory uh, of the of the coalition of of Austria and Prussia. Uh, they've made that abundantly plain. That's why they tried to flee to the enemy in in 1791. Um, so this, uh, you, you could say it's a kangaroo court, but um, it's not as if they're people who are, are innocent. They're hoping, they're hoping uh, that the foreign coalition will overthrow their own their own army and reinstate the old regime. So, you know, historians can say, well, the evidence for actually being traitors in terms of selling secrets and all the rest of it, passing on military secrets, is very vague. Uh, but one thing that is not vague is that Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette actively want France to lose the war. Yeah. And people would argue in the, in the National Convention that tries them would say that is an act of high treason. When you're the king and queen of the country at a time of international war, if you're doing everything in your power to see that, that the enemy wins, that's an act of high treason. Yeah. And that's effectively the argument. Now, there is this appalling store arguments for in the court of Marie Antoinette that they convince her own child that she had sexual, sexually yep. abused him. And I think I want to talk about the fate and the tragedy of Louis XVII as well, because there is this appalling that it can, and as a child, of course, you're made to believe these stories, and eventually it's not yeah. easy to, quite easy to convince you that, yes, she did actually do this thing, it's quite easy to, to corrupt the child. So, but Louis XVII would have a tragic, tragic, tragic end to his life. Yeah. So let's talk about the court case with Marie Antoinette and Louis XVII as well. Oh, yes, as I said earlier, there's no doubt that uh, Marie Antoinette is the target of some um, horribly misogynistic abuse and all sorts of wild allegations about her behaviour as a mother. Um, and, yeah, they're just um, uh, absolutely horrible and and inaccurate uh, statements that are made, yeah. Uh, but this is a time of war to the death and people will believe anything. Cool. Let's talk about the fate of Louis XVII because, as you know, and we're going to have to, Louis, we'll have to end yeah. up quite soon. Yeah, we'll have to that's end fine. up quite um, soon. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but I want, I want to talk about, of course, Robespierre as well a little bit because we mentioned well, him let's in the talk about Robespierre. So that's much more important. And how, how he came in to the to, to this revolution as well because that's really, he is quite important. And he would, of course, end up killing himself under the Napoleonic regime, but let's talk, uh, not try to kill himself, but let's talk a little bit about Robespierre. Well, Robespierre in some ways is typical of the, uh, of his social, uh, his social group across France. He's um, a lawyer. He's typical of the provincial lawyers who dominate the National Assembly. Um, you know, he's a prominent small town lawyer. 
uh, who's absolutely committed to the ideals of the revolution, who sees the Declaration of the Rights of Man almost like the Ten Commandments. Um, he believes them completely. Uh, he's, you know, he's very typical of uh, of re uh, reform-minded, pro-revolutionary, um, middle-class lawyers and professional people. Uh, what's different about Robespierre is that um, he uh, is popularly seen as being someone who is completely above corruption. He's called the incorruptible. Uh, and he, he is seen to be someone who is absolutely uncompromising in his um, commitment to key revolutionary principles. Uh, he's prepared to be unpopular, uh, but he's very consistent uh, across the revolution in terms of, of what he believes. So that uh, by 1792, uh, even though he himself was initially very opposed to the war, uh, by 1792, when the National Convention is elected after the overthrow of the monarchy, he's really the most popular politician in the whole country. Well, so what leads to his attempted suicide of escape and eventually guillotine in under the Napoleonic regime later? No, it's not. He's it's not under the Napoleonic mm. regime. In, right. In, in 1794, the big issue in the middle of 1794 is that the Committee of Public Safety, of which he's a member, has been very successful in overseeing the, the war effort, and they've effectively won the war. And the issue then becomes, to what ex to, when is it safe to uh, end all of the uh, controls on public life that we call the terror? When is it safe to stop putting people on trial, to stop arresting people? When is it safe to go back to constitutional peacetime government? Now, uh, Robespierre uh, doesn't believe the time is yet ripe uh, to go back to constitutional government, uh, and he's overthrown in July 1790 uh, in July 1794. Historians disagree about whether he tries to commit suicide or whether he's shot. Uh, by a gendarme when he's being arrested, but he's effectively guillotined in um, in July 1794 along with his supporters. Uh, no, but there are... hmm. Sorry, uh, there are a few things I want to talk about as well uh, post-revolution before we wrap up, and of course we're going to mention the execution of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette in a second. But before that, I want to talk about some things that I find a little silly personally because one of them is the revolutionary calendar that they instate yes. after the revolution. Yes. Well, um, it's a way uh, of of Jacobin revolutionaries expressing the significance of what they're achieving. So that you need to remember that in 1793, when France is a republic, it is effectively at war with the whole of Europe. It's surrounded by hostile uh nations which are which are invading there are lots of foreign troops on french soil uh so this is seen by revolutionaries inside france to be really a battle over the the birth of a whole new era of human history you know that's how high the stakes are this is not just a war between nations this is a war about the future of humanity and that's why it's decided um on the first anniversary of the proclamation of the Republic in September 1792, why well, it's decided in September 1793 that the best way to commemorate the significance of what's being achieved is to introduce a whole new revolutionary calendar, which would uh, see the, uh, the proclamation of the Republic in September 1792 as the first day of the year one of equality, of a whole new era of human history. So it's really symptomatic of how significant uh, people feel that the the battle is in 1793. Oh. And another thing I want to talk about before we get to the execution is the the Christianization of France as well, which was um, another failed attempt of uh, the revolution. Sorry, what was the... What, the the what Christianization... We... Of France, oh, yes. which was another attempt, failed attempt of the revolution. Well, again, uh, it's it's a reflection of the fact that the the Catholic Church, uh, the official Catholic Church, 
was on the side of the coalition was blessing the armies of the of the of the counter revolution. So the Catholic Church was part of the enemy coalition that France was fighting against. And so there is a, a a deep, deep hostility among revolutionaries towards the Catholic Church. And for some people, the most militant revolutionaries, they see this as a time when they actually need to purge France of Christianity. Uh, people like Robespierre are very opposed to this. Robespierre's view is that you can be a good Catholic and a good revolutionary. Mm. But many of the more militant people uh, believe that Christianity itself uh, is is simply superstition. And how, how did Talleyrand, who was a former bishop, feel about the Christianization of France? Oh, he thinks it's ridic uh, ridiculous. Um, but these are these are people who see the church as as much an enemy of the revolution as the Kingdom of England or the Empire of Austria. Uh, they see the papacy and the Catholic Church as part of the enemy, uh, which they need to destroy, uh, just as the Catholic Church wants to completely destroy the, the revolution. Now, let, let, we don't have much time, on, on, uh, but we will have to talk about the execution of Louis XVI and, of course, later Marie Antoinette and the guillotine as well. And I want to bring up the famous last word of Louis, who was, I'm innocent, and it's something in the line of view, it was always a king from France. And that he dies an innocent man, but he, I do think he forgives the people as well before he dies. Well, again, we we don't know we 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 don't know for sure exactly what he said, but it seems as though he made uh, uh, remarks along the lines of what you're saying that uh, he pardoned the people that were putting to were putting him to death and hoped that the bloodshed would end. Uh, he seems to have said, you know, similar words to that, but we can't be 100% sure. Hmm. Now, let's talk about Marie Antoinette's execution as well, because I see, I'm sure you've seen the Napoleon movie, but Napoleon wasn't as present at the execution at all, of course. But let's talk. So let's no. talk. But, but Marie Antoinette was quite strong all the way until the end. She only trembled at her execution, even though she, she was mocked by the people and she... As she walked up the duty, and she was quite a strong woman all the way to the end of her execution. Oh, sure, and it's uh, you know be, being paraded through the streets of Paris and be, uh, and being abused was it would have been an absolutely hideous experience. Uh, and certainly, all of the evidence is that you know, like Louis the Sixteenth, uh, that she went to her execution with a great deal of personal strength and dignity. Uh, that's for sure. Hmm. And, and before we end, I want to talk as well, like I said, of the tragedy of the, their son, Louis XVII, who would die alive yeah. and die a terrible, lonely yeah. and horrible death. Oh, that's right. And again, there's, um, we're not we're not 100% sure of uh, exactly uh, what he dies of. Uh, whether he simply catches a disease or whether he's actually um, the victim of deliberate um, abuse in prison. We just don't know. Um, one thing it's worthwhile remembering, and he was a very, uh, you know, he was quite a sickly little boy, by the way. One thing that's worth remembering uh, is that in June 1789, uh, the, the oldest son of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette had died at the age of six. Uh, we think of tuberculosis. So it, it's worthwhile thinking that at the very time in, in, in June 1789, when things are really getting out of hand for Louis the Sixteenth uh, at the Estates General, you know, the, the, it's a very politically difficult situation. There's a great deal of tension, a great deal of division, a great deal of unrest. And in the middle of all of that, uh, the heir to the throne, who's only six years old, dies. And it must have been a terrible situation for that family to have to uh, deal with their grief at the loss of a child at the very moment when the whole country's in such upheaval. And mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask as well before we round up, who, who did the revolution really benefit? Uh, in the end, when 
they successfully overthrew the monarchy and put them on trial and all the things that happened. Who did the revolution really Oh, the revolution uh, primarily benefits the, the two biggest beneficiary, beneficiaries um, are the um, professional middle classes because it opens up uh, careers for talented people. You no longer have to be a noble to get to the top of French society. If, if, secondly, I may, that... if, if, if I may add to that, uh, one such person is Bernadotte, who was a soldier who cannot become a general because yeah, you right. have to be that a nobleman here, of course, would end up being king of Sweden. So, so he benefited yeah. quite well of the revolution. Yeah. A lot of Napoleon's generals are uh, of common birth. And the, uh, the other group are uh, land-owning peasants with the other major beneficiary. Hmm. And that's no. why the revolution is successful, because the great mass of the population that own uh, some land as peasant farmers um, are direct beneficiaries of the abolition of feudalism. Let's round it up there, and I hope that you found this a good overview of the revolution. Before you go, do you have any social media you want to share with us or any books you want to share in or links in the description if people have any questions about the revolution, if they want to ask you about anything or if they want to, any, want to read further about the revolution, do you have any books or things you want to promote before you go? Uh, oh, certainly. <laughs> certainly people can uh, have a look at my, uh, my major book about the French Revolution, which is simply called Liberty or Death, which is a history of the French Revolution. Uh, but if people are interested in in very specific events, one of my favourite books is by Timothy Tackett, uh, which is about the King's flight in 1791. Um, uh, that which is a, a a wonderful book to to read. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to talk to with you. And my okay. name is Alan. We are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Wherever you can find podcasts these days, if you are on Spotify, please give us five stars if you like this episode or this podcast in general. That would help us out a lot. You can also give one, but I would prefer five. But if you are on Apple Podcast, please just either write in a review and I'll try to find it and read it on the podcast later. I'd love to see more reviews of the podcast on Apple Podcast. If you are on YouTube, please like, share and subscribe and leave a comment if you like this episode as well. And don't forget to share our podcast. My name is Alan. This has been World at H12. And I'll see you next time.